Hey everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis, the Black Iron Prison series, where we talk to artists, creators, philosophers, and today we have, returning back to the show, actually, Kristen Middleton to talk about her upcoming book. Hello, Kristen. Hey, we're going solo this time. Usually Chris is with me, but uh, happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you. Just you know, one, one, one Chris this time, but I'm sure we will yeah, probably right. have some. <laughs> we'll probably have two Chris's again in the future, because yeah. uh, uh, I really love the work that, that you folks are doing with, with with your different projects. So I definitely wanted to talk to you about, I should say, upcoming book, right, or shortly soon to be released book. Uh, Kristen, tell us about it. Tell us what it's called. Tell us what it is. Just, just go off, Queen. So it's called Sparks from a Dark Woods, and it's a collection of work that I've done that deals with some longer stories and then also just a lot of ideas that I tend to work with, a lot of stuff that involves a lot of esoteric ideas. Um, I do a lot of dream content and that sort of stuff, too. So it's sort of a grand recontextualizing of a lot of things that are important to me and kind of packaged in this very dream-like sort of quality. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of watercolors, a lot of sketches, and also some poetry too. Chris has a poem in it as well. Well, wonderful, yes. And, and just what I've uh, picked up from the, um, um, from some of the art you've been sharing on social media, as well as your art style that I've seen on your Instagram, which is instagram.com slash uh, Christian, Christian Middleton. Uh, the links will be down below, <laughs> folks. Name. Yeah. <laughs> Christian it's Middleton. Middle, uh, yeah. Chris, uh, people, people, don't listen to me. Just click the link that's down in the notes, okay? <laughs> um, but I have noticed, yeah, the watercolors, the dreaminess to it, right? Um, yeah. It's uh, it, it, it's very beautiful. It's very lush. And, of course, it, I, I don't know much about the book. I was just excited when, when you said that you were, you were putting it out because yeah, I, I really liked Ayana Comics. I really liked talking to you before, and I really liked the, the, your art in general that you've been sharing yeah. so um so i kind of like guessed that there was going to be this kind of dreamlike quality because it is sort of pervaded by by what you're already putting out and and already i'm, I'm gonna you know when we get off the call or when the book comes out i'm, I'm gonna send you over to my friend patch who has a, a podcast called dream lovers which is uh Ooh, which, which I, I i hope you two can connect uh, since he's uh really kind of digging into to to dreams and dream work and spreading the gospel of dream work and and what have you i uh uh, the, you know, when, when, of course, when we had, uh, uh, when we spoke to you and Chris, uh, we, we did talk about psychoanalysis, which I'm deeply interested yeah. in. Uh, unfortunately, I use sleep aids for, uh, for sleep. And that means mm. I don't remember my dreams. And it's, oh, okay. it's not Sometimes good. Sometimes it makes it more vivid, too, I've, uh, I've heard. It, it can. It, it depends. It depends on the sleep aid. So I, I am hoping yeah. to to sort of fix my sleep up for, of course, lots of reasons, right? So that I can function and yeah. not feel like garbage. Um, but I, I miss I miss dreaming. Could you could you talk a little bit more about the kind of dreams as inspiration? What you're taking from your mm -hmm. actual dreams um, uh, and and the impact on on your work and on this book? Well, I think that the psycho, uh, psychoanalysts are a good place to start. However, I think it's much broader than that too. Um, I started writing down my dreams more religiously, I would say about two years ago. And the moment I started doing that, they started becoming a lot more vivid. And in my own work, I also take, I guess, waking dream or creative license with it as well. But I feel like everything kind of stems from these central ideas that keep coming up from my dreams. And I think that dreams kind of have a negative connotation sometimes um, with people nowadays where they kind of write it off or they see it as just a collection of uh, things from the day. But I'm sure anybody who's watching a show like Talk Gnosis knows that there's a much broader world to the dream life. And um, at least as an artist, I've found it extremely valuable because it shows me what's truly important to me, even if it's the things that I maybe sometimes try to ignore in waking life. And I have a lot of kind of themes that keep coming back. And um, just as an artist and as a person, it really makes me feel a lot more grounded with what I'm supposed to do um, in my work and in my life in general. 
Amazing. Yeah. I, uh, it, even the title is very evocative sparks from a dark woods. Yeah. And, uh, I, it's coming uh, from I, an interesting time. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, well, can you talk about the, the title? Can you talk about, you know, there is some nature imagery I've noticed and some of the, the, uh, what you're sharing, uh, you know, can you talk about what the dark woods mean for you? What the spark means yeah. for you? Obviously you don't have to like, break it down and explain it. This means this, but just the, the, yeah. uh, you know, the evocation of it and maybe kind of talk about some of the nature imagery and perhaps your own inspiration or connection to nature uh, as an yeah. artist. So there's a lot of things that still are kind of being revealed to me, so to speak, with that kind of stuff too. I feel like uh, a lot of it's not always straightforward, but the title comes from a feeling that I got of something that I was doing um, because things have been very interesting as I'm sure it has been for everybody in the last <laughs> year or so. And that's pretty much what it felt like I was doing. I was kind of choosing this very dark path that wasn't very lit and going for it. And um, I think with the nature elements, um, as I'm sure people who follow creative paths kind of relate to, as a child, I was very drawn to the woods and to nature. And one of the things that populates my work are these little creatures a lot of the time. And I'm very inspired by people like Hieronymus Bosch over on the other side. Yeah, I'm getting mixed up. Um, <laughs> and uh, people that really have this very intuitive um, sense for nature and sort of create these creatures that come out of the woods. Um, I guess uh, not to get too heady with it, but uh, I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, if you were to Please. describe my psyche, um, a lot of times it's very populated by these little creatures and I kind of have them symbolize different things to me. So I've kind of built, I guess, my own language of these little guys. It's probably not uh, always clear what certain ones mean, um, but it's sort of like creating poetry out of that. And um, I just, there's nothing that feels better to me than just being in the woods and kind of taking things in and kind of both seeing the woods for what it is physically, but then also in the Blakeian sense, looking for what could be the sort of higher sphere of it. And then my own imagination, and then hopefully if I'm clear enough, the uh, sort of, I guess, insight or more collective nature of the imagination, like things that need to be said. Um, I think that's the role of the artist in its most exalted sense is to try to get at that higher level. Yes, I, and I completely agree. And that's and obviously we love uh, speaking to artists uh, on this show, right? And it's it's kind of particularly for the for this uh, spinoff series, one of the main points of it. But at the same time, I find it very difficult as as a questioner, as a conversation partner, because I know that the wrong way to engage of art, and it's it's the way that people love to do now, is what does this mean, right? Give me a yeah. very <laughs> literal one to one. Just like... Yeah, instead of this. Uh, invocative evocative web of meaning that you know uh, uh that uh, streams forth from you but it's also uh, if you agree partly created by by the person who's going to be consuming your art who's going to be engaging with your art right that's why mm -hmm. i can't just you know point to something and be like what does this creature mean <laughs> right yeah um uh, i i i'm a libra um Libra season right now as we're recording this. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so supposedly me and my people, we have this need and a feeling like a deep relation, like we that like a need for nature and a feeling like we have a deep relationship with nature. But at the same time, if you left us in the woods, we'd die. Um, yeah. So <laughs> this is me, right? I I'm not. I I I I crave and I need the, this connection. But at the same time, I'm not. You know, I, I'm not going to go homesteading uh i'm, I'm not going to go you know the, for, for a long pack uh, up the mountain uh and, and to try to survive off the land for for a week right just i need to go to the woods recharge connect and then get out um but i i remember growing up i i grew up in sort of a a suburb but but that had some rural aspects it was close to the country and there was uh you know a wooded a wooded brook there that um uh, i grew up in a, in a place with a lot of celtic heritage and you know it was rumored to be haunted by by the fae oh, by the fairies yeah. right so so my my childhood was like what what if i could find them what if i could see them right um you know going into this this wooded area going into the dark woods looking for the fairies and, and of course i never literally saw them um and i i think i was disappointed at the time but you know now i realize that sort of creative uh connection with nature 
uh, that uh, is is whatever these these entities are, um, uh, as well as my own interpretation of them. Am I making sense? I was saying. Oh yeah, that totally. The, yes, <laughs> yeah. I've had the same thing when I was a child. I um, grew up partially because my grandparents lived there in upstate New York in the Catskills, mm -hmm. and um, this might even <laughs> this is kind of a weird one. But uh, when I was a little kid. I used to um, go out of the woods and then also every time I would go to bed, I'd sort of daydream about something and I took it very seriously. And I remember specifically, one of the things that always bothered me was the fact that the, this is really weird, that the devil was considered evil because a lot of times they depict him as Pan and yeah. different animals. And I'm like, how could animals be evil or like snakes or what? They're cool. Um, so I remember when I was a very little kid um, after, uh, spending the day upstate and then going to bed, I had this idea where it's like, okay, so if uh, if God's everywhere, then I can sort of uh, daydream and sort of ask them to reconcile and then things will be good. Um, so I had some weird uh, sort of like internal monologue and then I like was like, okay, like nature's good, it is not evil. And then uh, I was like, that's good enough for me. And then I, I just like, built this whole crazy system or whatnot but um yeah like growing up uh in places like that in the country especially ones with a lot of history like you were saying with the fey um we have a lot of stories with like um with Brad winkle and um the nature upstate too and i think that really affected me growing up too and it was something too where it was a uh, not something i was around constantly um, we still had the suburbs and then my father worked in New York City, so I'd go there a lot, but then also it was very important, I think, to have this sort of place of reprise uh, to go to. And I think that's come out a lot in my work. Perfect, perfect. And and can you talk a little bit more about, I mean, in, in my opinion, everything we're talking about already is specifically occult, <laughs> right? Yeah, because my idea <laughs> of what is the esoteric yeah. and the occult, right? It's, and uh, that, as I've said many times on the show, we'll say many more times, you know, whatever art is, uh, in my opinion, what well, good art, whether <laughs> well, it's, if yeah. it's bad art, it's not art, but um, <laughs> whatever good art well, is, it's, well, yeah. My, uh, I have a dream of making a book, like if aliens had an art, like a coffee table book, and it would just be graffiti that people have left throughout the oh, years, like, because yeah. it never changes. Like you could look back at like graffiti from ancient Greece, and it's probably very similar to the kind of stuff we're leaving now, but uh, not to get yeah. too off track. But. Well, no, this this is the the get off track show. It's it's yeah. the uh, it's, it's the chatty <laughs> show. Uh, but but that is a good point, right? Because uh, you, people, some people uh, have very uh, strange ideas about the past. Um, but uh, it is one of the things that really. Looking at graffiti is one of the things that kind of shows you our connections as humans, right? And yeah. uh, in a very crude sense, because, you know, I'm thinking of Roman graffiti, which is just like dicks or, or like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, it's exactly what, what kids draw now with graffiti. But it's like, yeah. oh, okay, you know, this, this, is, uh, this is crude, but at the same time, <laughs> it kind of shows that there's this continuity, you know, they, they're exactly. just like us. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, all right, so art, art okay, already cool. is magic. Art already is occultism, in my in my opinion. But it, you know, to make it a little bit more explicit, if you could talk about kind of maybe some, specifically some occult ideas or practices that might be influencing you in, in your in your work in uh, in Sparks from the Dark Woods. Hmm. I tend to I have my own meditation practice. And I have, I would not call myself an expert by any means, but definitely an interest in um, astrology and um, also people like Aleister Crowley. Um, and also I would say bigger in this context, people like Austin Osmond Spare and that sort yes. of thing on an automatic drawing. And um, specifically some of the work in Sparks from a Dark Woods that kind of come out of things like that. I have one um, called the, um, the secret procession, um, which was one that I just kind of was very frustrated that day. And I put everything I was doing aside and I'm like, I'm just going to meditate. I'm going to make something. And um, this whole image sort of came out of that. Um, I would say that I don't like, I wouldn't say that I'm a thelemite or anything like that, or have really a specific name, at least to the practice, what I, what I do in my work. Um, but I think that I am definitely a blend of people like Spare and then um, at least 
attempting to do sort of a um, Blakeian thing of making my own cosmology in that sort of way. Um, I don't know if I could ever make anything as beautiful and brilliant as Blake ever, but um, as far as occult ideas, that's the the three main places that I'm drawing from, I would say. Yeah. Well, you, you know, I, I, I'm a fan of your work. I, I think you're extremely talented, but if you're not as good as Blake, that that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> you know? it's There's not... a couple of places down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, very, very few are. But uh, uh, can you tell us more about about this cosmology, this personal cosmology that you're putting together, or, uh, th th that you're channeling, that you're exploring? Yeah. Um, it's still something that's being put together, and uh, I don't want to make it sound like a very serious sort of yeah. thing, because a lot of uh, a lot of things in the book are very whimsical. Yeah. But um, I lately, especially, have had a uh, focus on. I, it's kind of something that's been coming out to me in general too, but um, these little uh, like animals specifically, turtles have been coming up a lot. I've been working a lot on that. Um, it's very, I'll have to let the work sort of speak for itself with a lot of it. I don't wanna say too much now, um, but that's a big part of it. Um, in general, I've been focused a lot on um, processions and the ways that like things move in motion in general. Um, I don't know if I'm getting too off track here, but I forget exactly where this idea is from. But a while ago, I heard that there's an idea where um, demons or lower things are very chatty mm -hmm. when things of a higher sort of illumination work mainly through uh, motion and impression. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been making a lot of work that revolves around that, because that's a very important idea to me. And I came up with a character kind of like the angel of happenstance that has these lenses and is able to read and sort of influence things with them. Uh, they make an appearance in the book too, along with um, my own version of these sort of fae folk like creatures that, um, that I'm developing for their own ends and different things too. Um, yeah. Hopefully that answers the question, I hope. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll let the work speak for itself in a lot of ways. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. And I, I too really like that idea. Or instead of demons, I'll say sublunar spirits to, yeah. to, yeah, to not scare off anybody who, who might have yeah, too not, much mainstream uh... <laughs> Christian uh, programming in their head. But, you know, if you think of a sort of a traditional uh, neoplatonic or Kabbalistic universe, right, you know, you're, you're going up. So it make and, and, things get more conceptual as you go up, right? Mm -hmm. So the entities that are up there stop being like us because they are far away from us and we mm -hmm. emanate from these original sources and the things that are, of course, down lower, you know, they're hanging around here. They're sublunar. They're below those spheres. They know what's up. They're able to talk our language because this is where they where we yeah. hang out. I like I like those ideas. I think that's cool. Um, what was I going to, to say? Um, the... Surrealism. You, you know, one of the things that has that, that sort of gotten me into the occult and psychoanalysis was, you know, I am a very big fan of, of 20s, 1920s um, art in general, right? So both physical art and also writing and, you know, the the first the, the first uh, modernist uh, uh, novels and experimental novels, which are mostly created uh, through, you know, automatic writing, unstructured writing. Um, so and then kind of finding out that uh, all these uh, people, all these artists that I really liked uh, were involved of either psychoanalysis, the occult or both. Right. And of course, this is yeah. very obvious when you look at the techniques that are in psychoanalysis that are in occultism, you know, mentioning sphere. But uh, can you talk a little bit about surrealism, its, its influence and impact on you if you consider your your work surreal? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, this might be uh, a little bit of a silly thing to say. But uh, this is just kind of a cool fact that I like. But apparently, me and Salvador Dali have like extremely similar charts in uh, astrology, which I wear as a undeserved badge of pride. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, surrealism is extremely important for me, and that was actually probably the thing that really inspired me the most as far as periods in art history. Um, also, the proto surrealist as well. Um, I think. I forget exactly who it was. It might have been um, it might have been Breton himself, but there's a lineage of artists too. I remember in the early surrealist texts and magazines that they would put out, 
where they trace their sort of early lineage. And also one of my favorite artists is a, a Renaissance artist, but he's sort of considered like a grandfather of surrealism and his name is Piero di Cosimo. And um, he was somebody who was like, just like a really singular Renaissance artist, but really sort of embodied a lot of the early surrealist ideals. So I got a lot into his work. Um, and I think that just what the surrealist project was trying to do right around the time when they were trying to do it is something that is still very important to look at for now because uh, as things continue to get surrealer and more abstract, I think a lot of the ideas and practices like the surrealist games that they would play to create their work is something that uh, I think every artist should at least, at least have a basis in um, when they create their own work. Um, yeah, that's yeah. The, the gist of it. I, I, I agree. And, you know, I, and I think of, of the games and the techniques. And, you know, I, I find we live in, in an extremely literal uh, society right now. A very, uh, uh, you, even though right brain, left brain apparently is BS. When I say yes. right brain, people know what I, what I mean, right? Did I get that right? Right brain? Yeah. So it's very, very, very literal. Very, very literal. Uh, very narrative. Very easy to understand. Um, so I, I really uh, appreciate uh, artists like yourself and people bringing this these techniques uh these ideas these uh the the, the style of art uh to to prominence right um you know i think of Dali, i think his technique was uh sitting in a chair holding holding a pen or a cup and he would try to enter the hypnagogic state so fall asleep yes. but not all the way right and then the cup or pen was there to wake him up um so that he didn't fall asleep yeah um or and, and of course the the techniques of of spare to 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 get there or uh, even david lynch i believe it's meditation right like he says you know he sits and <laughs> meditates yeah yeah tm so um i'm not going think, anywhere with this so yeah. please talk <laughs> i think that um Another important thing that you brought up, because things are very literal right now, or as Blake would put it, it's very uh, your reason in that like sort of your reason oro state. However, I think that that's really unfortunate, or there's two ways of looking at it, because a lot of people focus on the negative now, but it's, it's almost sort of very easy to forget. Like we're using, we're talking to each other now on something like this that didn't exist only like less than a lifetime ago. And um, one of the coolest things I think with, um, what we have available to us now is it sort of recontextualizes the past in a way where you can kind of take these really obscure writers or have like everything at your fingertips in a way that makes it feel so much more alive. Um, I think there's some really brilliant cases where people that got like a really raw deal in life, uh, like certain musicians like uh, Jackson C. Frank or whatnot, um, they are sort of being given a resurgence only because it's things like this and uh, media that uses those sorts of things. And you could get into a deeper meaning with that too, where almost in a way, because you have, like you could take somebody's entire life and um, their entire works and make it so readily available. And you can compare like, what was this person trying to do at this time? How did it influence this sort of person? You can always do that. But the fact that we have something that makes it so easy now, I feel like, the idea, if you want to think about like truly living texts or truly living uh, media of the past, we can kind of really condense and play with things in a way like never before. And um, I think that there's just a lot of different, because um, if you get into the people too that focus on um, using the uh, technology for more esoteric or occult ends too, there's a whole nother world with that. And um, even though it's very easy to feel that things are very disconnected and far away from that, I think that it's important to think about just how truly insane and I guess for lack of a better word, uh, magical what we have now is and like what can be done if we kind of get out of our uh, mundane way of thinking about it. Yeah, I agree. And kind of often too much i sort of default on, on this show right because you know the, the, the to, to negativity because the the gnostics yeah, didn't have, 
yes, it's easy, right? The Gnostics <laughs> didn't have the most positive view of the world. And by the world there, I don't mean nature. I mean the world system, in my opinion. But so it, it's easy to sort of look at these these dreadful existential themes and talk uh, about them a lot in the show. But, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be into this stuff if it wasn't for the world we live in now, right? I wouldn't be able to have mm -hmm. conversations like this. I wouldn't have been able to find occult communities. Like, maybe I could have, but honestly, I wouldn't have, right? I wouldn't have made those connections, especially, you know, being from a smaller place, having gone to university in a smaller place. You know, I, I mean, my, I've been in Montreal for a long time now, but but still. Uh, and also just having access to all of human knowledge. <laughs> that is yeah. pretty dang cool. And, and and like you said it, right? Like, I, I'm like, you know, I want to be cool and know, know every artist, but I watch Joker and I'm like, this carnival song is a banger, yeah. right? That, that's how I found Frank. So it's yeah. like... Um, uh, this is, this is, you know, th 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 there are some, th 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 there's, there's some great stuff here. Uh, um, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I, I'm not a Thelemite either, but th there is, there is lots of Thelemite. Uh, it does inform some, some of my praxis and some of my views of the world. And, and something they did get right was making William Blake a literal saint. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> Saint in, in some in some ways the Messiah of the of of the new Aeon in my my humble opinion but mm -hmm. yeah um, uh, uh, did you uh, did, uh, I didn't do a question sheet for this both because of lack yeah. of time and because uh, you know the the book's not out yet I don't I don't have it in my hands so you know we can only kind of speak in generalities mm -hmm. but uh, I, I don't really think we talked too much about Blake last time I, I think mm -hmm. we did a little bit because you know how can we not but can you talk a little bit about what uh, his inspiration on you um, and uh, what you get from him you know personally. Mm -hmm. I would say one of the things I get from him the most is the idea of the fourfold visions um, mm -hmm. and his way of sort of contextualizing the different modes of being and seeing the world. Um, I think that there's an analogy where you take the four stages and how you see the sun, which is the first one, your reason, or the oro state, which is obsessed with measuring the material world. Uh, very baseline things and they're unable to see what the what the sun is they only are obsessed with what's in front of them what they can tangibly hold and then the second one generation and you have a little bit more of idea that there's something to be worshipped in the sun but it's more obscured there's not really uh, a sense of what exactly that is and then you get to the next state, which is sort of a higher version of that, where you are relating with other people. There's a sense of love, but it's still very terrestrial. There's still the, it's not clear. And then the final being when you are aligned with the sort of divine um, revelation of things and um, what the true purpose of what you're doing is. Um, and I think that as an artist, um, it's very influential to me. Um, Blake sort of, I think, is a guide of how to be a artist in the most healthy way. Um, because none of the states are evil or necessarily ones that you can never be in, but you need to have a balance of everything to be able to create the best work that you can and um, I think that that's something because a, a lot of times now like we were just saying you lose sight of the higher spheres of imagination and um, I think that Blake is the best person to go to if you really want to get a good system of how to go forth in the world now. Yeah. Um, so Sparks from a Dark Woods isn't the only work that you, you have coming out that's out. Uh, yeah, Aeonic, Aeonic Comics. 3. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. So could you could you tell Exciting. us about tell us about two and three actually? And did you have pieces yeah. in 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 both? Um, yeah, just just uh, the, the, tell us about them. I have pieces in one and two. I have some of okay. my art um, just used for pages in three. Um, the piece that I personally have in one and two are chapters one and two of my story, The Last Saint. Um, the other installment for three, I want to make that perfect. So it's kind of, I put it a bit on the back burner. Um, but it is not just my work. It's also the work of um, Chris Gabriel and then also a bunch of artists from all around the world who work both in um, experimental comics, uh, writing, and um, also occult, esoteric ideas and everything like that. Hello. 
For those listening, we just dropped Jason in. Uh, Jason, we have been going for a half an hour, and I asked all the good questions. Yeah, but I yeah, <laughs> I am I am happy you're here. Um, I I blame the archon of time zones. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, also, I you know we were we we had some scheduling stuff, and we kind of threw it together at at the last moment. So, um, but uh, yes. Uh, happy that you could uh, join us. Uh, we were talking about Aonic Comics, uh, the, the one and two, but also three. Yeah, can you tell us uh, 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 s some of the highlights for you in issue three, Kristen? Uh, in issue three, I think some of the pieces I'm most excited for is that we have some longer form um, content with comics, some great um, artists who uh, haven't submitted before. Um, we have one actually that's really cool about um, the art, uh, Sean Pryor's work in it about his experience with um, UFOs and dreams, um, which is a very exciting topic. And I think it's very important for if you consider new Aeon sort of ideas of um, uh, higher spheres or different beings and whatnot. I think that, that that's how we start this issue. And I think it sets it off very well. Um, we have actually a play this time too, a um, written play um, how to make an apple pie that's sort of an a, uh, existential view of the world and how it was created. Um, that's really cool too. We haven't had a, a play before included, so that's uh, very neat. And um, I think that this issue, uh, one and two were a sea legs issue, but going forth, we are creating a sort of symbolic cycle that's going to be put more into play now too. And we're also working on a manifesto as well to give to artists and show people a little bit of a clear idea of what we're doing too. So all exciting stuff in the works. Very cool, yeah. And and you know the, the people at home uh, 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 can't see, but uh, Jason and I's eyes lit up with the with the mention of a play since we, we both have theater backgrounds. I'm a oh, former, yeah. former playwright, recovering playwright. So I'm really glad that, that you folks are, are going truly, truly multimedia. Um, yeah. Can you, uh, going back uh, to, to your book, to Two Sparks from a Dark Woods, and this is one of my leading questions that I'm hoping you're going to give an answer to, and then Jason will have one of his great riffs on. So this is this is kind of a dumb question, but it, it goes it goes back to, to, to earlier in the conversation when, when I said I feel, and of course people are, are welcome to disagree, that, that that we live in a in a very literal uh, uh, society, right? Uh, people want very clear answers to things. So I, uh, which I don't necessarily think that's what what art is for. But can you tell us like why, like just why, why, why are you doing this book? Why are you putting it out yourself? Like why? Big question mark. Why indeed? Um, I would say. It is important to have people who are trying to make art that is breaking the really rigid molds that we've created for ourselves. There's, and this is the central project of Aeonic Comics as well, but there are so many ideas of what art is now. We're inundated with images, we're inundated with media, and I think we really need something that hones it back to trying to explore the internal world, trying to explore the connected internal worlds of things and not just be trying to make a comic, let's say, with the idea of what a comic book is or what art is supposed to be. And I think that with myself and with Chris, that is our central idea. We want to usher in what's new. We want to get all of the best artists together and try to create the best work ourselves in order to really make what's important and i think like find those messages that artists are supp uh, supposed to bring out to people yeah exactly jason not so that's why that's why jason any <laughs> riffs just throwing them into the fire <laughs> i uh yeah i think like well i mean i maybe i want to kind of take that um take what you said and sort of like lens it or explode it like uh because you were also talking before earlier about them the notion of sea legs for aeonic comics so, so like to go back to the to your project, if this is like you know you've got the sea legs, what's the what's the uh, like admiralty of this idea? Like you know how uh, what what's the way of taking that same concept, but like all the resources, all the time, all the all the the headspace. You know what I mean? Hmm. Um, for dark woods or for Aeonic? For dark woods. Hmm. 
I would say that this is sort of an introduction for what I want to continue to be my own sort of artistic system um, to both, I guess, for my own self, have my own um, both dream and sort of intuitive ideas about things put on display, but then put to um, its highest degree, I would like it to sort of take on a life of its own and continue to develop that further, if that answers your question. Does it, Jason? Yeah. Uh, it totally does. Yes. <laughs> That's Sorry. good, yeah. Oh, man. You know, I just realized. So uh, the, the, for the folks at home, I, I know that we're, that, that Jason and I look incredibly youthful and sexy and vibrant and, oh boy. Uh, yeah. But but we, we and, and, and a lot of people out there, at, at there don't know this, but we actually literally have the same birthday the same year. So we, we both turned 40. Oh. Um, that's right. Right, Jason? Same year as well? Uh, not the same year. No, I'm oh, 42. Well, Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Actually, you are youthful. So, <laughs> okay. Same. Oh, thank you. same. <laughs> I thought it was the same year. There we that. go. Anyways, mm. same same birthday. <laughs> so, so sorry, Jason. I'm 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 being kind of cruel here for a second, but I'm going to try. We were talking about Libras, or I was uh, talking about Libras. So now I can find out if astrology is true or false. Uh, Jason, what's oh. your relationship with nature? Um, uh, pretty peaceful. Uh, I like to wander around in it. Um, I try to respect it. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think uh, it's generally recuperative for me. Okay, okay. And do you spend like, a, do you like, a, like backpack into the woods and like spend a week there? Or you like, do you consider yourself like a real like wild man, like, like this really like earthy, like I can walk into the woods and survive uh, 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 kind of person? Not at all. No, I'm more of a like take a drive to the mountains, have a nice, you know, uh, low pressure hike, uh, take a drive back. <laughs> Damn, see, astrology's real, real, folks. It's real. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's exactly what I, I was here. We saying. Figured it out. Nature. Okay. Okay. Great. Perfect. Yeah. We proved, we you heard it here astrology. first, folks. Yeah. This, yeah. We've scientifically <laughs> yeah. proven Libras. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the going back to to Aeonic Comics and the uh, the manifesto, which uh, um, what's the nice way to say this? I'm I'm looking forward to the to the manifesto. Um, and as I said, uh, I'm not going to again. I, I'm I'm not I'm not going to talk about <laughs> about my feelings about today's society as if the past was that much better. Yeah. But um, can can you give us? A, a, a bit of a hint or, or, or talk about what, what's going to be going into this manifesto. I know you already talked about, you know, the, the, what you see as the importance of art, but can you, can you, can you spin a little bit more on that if possible? We are going to attempt to give people a clear way of seeing the Aeon and what it can be. Uh, we're breaking it down into three symbols. Um, and to give you a hint onto one of them, um, there's the symbol of the headless child who's sort of dancing and weaving his way into things, but the head is, is still needs to be formed. And that is sort of a way that we see ourselves now where the old Aeon of Pisces has ended, but we're still sort of in this desert state, sort of bringing things together. So we will not see the time of cathedrals when everything's concrete, but the important thing for us to do is to be like John the Baptist-like figures to be able to usher things in um, another thing that we want to have clearly in the manifesto is the I idea of seeing time differently as not being linear, but to see things in cycles and uh, aeonic time as well. Um, that is one of the things I think that's going to be very important um, going forward and kind of with people um, to know what kind of work to submit. Yeah. I. Uh, and we did talk about this previously on the on the other shows, and uh, Jason and I think I talked about it a little bit of Angie Angie speaks, um, which is the this idea of entering a new aeon, which I don't know is literally true. On the other hand, I don't know, you know, at, at, at the, the collective unconscious is all there is in my it's opinion. It's all about if it functions. It's not yes. about if it's true or not, but does it function? Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the, for some of my spiritual ancestors as well, as I said, you, there is. I'm not a fellow. Might have some inspiration from from Palima, but some of the uh, some of the the groups I'm directly uh, in and directly connected with. So the Gnostics at the end of the 1800s, right? They thought it was the beginning of a new aeon, the beginning of a new age. But I, I wonder if you if you agree. I, I think a lot of people think 
coming from the more 60s idea of of the new age that it is it is a clean break right it is it is the messiah coming and and pushing in something new but the new aeon goes through birth pangs and i think do do you, do you agree with that and do you think that what we're yes. experiencing are the birth pangs which might by the way you know be uh even even if you're looking at the shift from from pisces uh it, it takes a long time right so mm -hmm. it, this could be generations generations hundreds of years because often the aeons last a very long time but yeah if we could spin on that i think that you can see the birth pangs very clearly in the way that um at least everybody seems to have a sense that the old sort of moral and um, uh, structures that held things up are falling apart or having a very difficult time um, adjusting to the way that things are now. Um, even people who don't really seem to uh, have these ideas in their lives, that seems to be a shared uh, sentiment now more than ever. And um, I think that any time a new way about uh, living is being formed, um, the first thing that comes is a desperate attempt to try to bring everything back to um, the center of what was. Um, so I think we definitely see that sentiment now. Uh, anybody who's uh, paying attention or, or trying to live in a, a place that's not the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I really again the, for the for you know I, I don't know if it's literally true or even where I got the idea or if I'm going or if I'm going to say it accurately, but I've uh, the Jason I've dropped this in, in the lodge chat before, but there's an idea in some Rosicrucian streams that there is that there's a shorter cycle, uh, mm -hmm. uh, often a 110 year cycle. But what I really like about it is is that the cycle um, can pivot to to one of two extremes, right? Where either where I where either there's a mini golden age, um, the, the good things will happen or bad things will happen, and it's kind of up to humanity and what's going on and what's going on with the I don't know light workers whatever to sort of to yeah. sort of break break through break break through on that to act at, at this liminal time um, for humanity to act at this liminal time to, to sort of set what kind of change is is going to come and something about that really really appeals to me uh, Jason do you a new age a new way on a, a new time the, the the return of the, the Saturn King what, what, where are you at with that stuff yeah uh, well, big question. Um, well, and we we already proved that uh, astrology is real. So, like, let's prove the aeons are are, uh, are real. Um, but I think one of the things that always strikes me is that I think we always want to feel like we are either um, about to leave or enter a new place. Um, and so, I think like I I tend to think that it's more like um, the ability to see an aeon will be more useful looking like a, a, as a review than an anticipation, if that makes sense, um, which isn't to say that you give up, but I think it's more like, um, I think you're always trying to manifest that Aeon in the world around you uh, in, in the sense of like the actual actual direct actions you can take with the with the work that you're doing and like creating art like Aeonic Comics, um, uh, uh, having the conversations that uh, that we have among us. Like, I think that's that's the kind of stuff that if there's going to be a new way on, that's how you help make it happen. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I would agree to that. I think again, it's we're it's a time where it doesn't matter if it's necessarily true. Uh, I think everybody also, no matter what time you're alive, has the idea of, like the world is ending now. Um, but it's how the what energy the idea and the belief creates and how you're wielding it that's important. Mm -hmm. There's a uh, there's some text that I can't remember. A friend of mine who's a history major mentioned this was that like. Uh, it's so there, there's this like old old like it's from like like the time of Gilgamesh like or the time of that writing or something, um, and the text the text starts with like when I entered the city of Ur, the world was already old. Um, now because so for that writer at that time he thought he was at the end of history, um, whereas that for us is like almost as far back as we can find, um, and. What I what I appreciate about that is that it's, it's that sense of perspective that like right now or like whatever whatever now is we will always look back and see the cycles and see the histories and and create that that narrative of it and think that we are at the at the end of a history. Uh, yeah. But like 
as is always the case, you will always find yourself in the middle of history. We're always in the middle of history, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and so how do you make that history versus how do you try to close the chapter of the book, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. I think it's only uh, understandable too. It's unfortunate, but I think like just the knowledge that we only live a hundred years, we want to feel that there's not going to be very much left that we're missing out on, at least uh, <laughs> that we're missing out on in this incarnation. If you want to go the whole uh, maybe Kali Yuga idea about it, ever going to go on that territory. But, um, but yeah, I, I completely agree. And that's yeah. a good point. Mm -hmm. Jason, it might even be the, the same ancient tablet or something, but I know the, one, one of the first pieces of writing that we have, besides Gilgamesh, is, is a tablet with a guy saying that the world's going to end soon, and he's complaining about kids these days. Uh, I think actually that's his logic, is <laughs> yeah. that he's like, kids these days, uh, they're lazy, they don't respect their elders, this must be a sign yeah. of the end times. And it, again, it's just like, you know, the more things change, the more things stay the same. <laughs> so Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I so like what I've always... Um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll do my, uh, my, um, uh, habitual Alan Moore reference is that I think his definition of magic is, um, uh, is the, the act of engaging with consciousness or the, the art of engaging with consciousness, both yours and the consciousnesses of, of those that are interacting with your magic or your art. And that he also sees art and magic as basically the same thing. Um, uh, and that like, artists would do better if they thought themselves as, as magicians and magicians would do better if they thought of themselves as artists. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I think where I'm kind of going with that is that um, uh, when going back to the quote that you mentioned there, uh, Jonathan, about like somebody from the earliest writing we have sounding like they could be writing a Facebook post now is that, um, is that what we, like I think the benefit of the, the work that we're talking about here today is that it is about engaging uh, like how to take a step outside of the cycle that will mean that you will perpetually be saying kids these days, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's that ability to step out of the stream, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Christian, I, I don't know. And then this is, this is again, something that's rampant in our society, but I don't know why I do the things that I do, right? I'm trying to figure it out, but <laughs> even, even the Gnostic stuff or, or doing the work with the AJC. Now, now there are of course reasons why, why I do it. And I know why, but I feel compelled and that, that goes for whatever I've been interested in, in art stuff or working as an artist, uh, or back when I worked in theater, it's, it's, I didn't, I felt like I almost had no choice in the matter, right? Mm -hmm. a, a mysterious um, a compulsion that, that, that just would keep tugging at me. Um, how, why, why are you an artist? Do you feel compelled to be an artist? <laughs> do you have any choice in the matter? No, I don't think I do. A lot of times I wish sometimes like, oh man, I really should have uh, tried to find something a little bit more stable. But then anything that just, I think it's just important to find those things that just light that fire in you. And um, you just have to follow that. It doesn't matter what it's called, but as long as that spark is there, um, following that and just going anywhere the path leads uh, into the dark woods as the spark goes um, and just kindling that fire. And at least for me, uh, art and writing were the ways to do that. Just having some sort of thing that holds that and uh, make it stays there. If you want me to go a little bit more on this point, um, I also teach art. Um, and one of the things I've found is that I think there are two initial um, art impulses, or I guess general types of um, artists. And there are people that care about the, the object. It's more of a technique focus for those types. And then there are the other type that look at it more like an icon that sort of puts them into a certain mindset or sort of it's a it's a thing of reverence or a more intuitive thing. And of course, everybody wants to do a skillful thing and the people that are more on the technique side still kind of have that. But I think there's two main poles. And as a child, I was definitely in the camp where it's like, I want to take these things and give them an object that at any point you can look at that and kind of get that transcendence um, and then connect it to a wider uh, picture for other people to do the same thing. And um, whether it's through writing or for um, through movies, animation, or just images, I just need to do that thing. Yeah, I uh, something very interesting. Uh, like when you said, you know, sometimes you would 
you'd gone into or you think about a, a more secure job, more secure career. It's yeah. both good and bad. But, you know, talking about the Kali Yuga, the world we live in now, is that now there is no secure job, well, right? <laughs> so well, my backup actually was uh, to be a mortician or to run a funeral home. And uh, you'll never ha run out uh, of something like that. So the there, Kali Yuga, I think exception. that's a pretty yeah. profitable business there. But I'm about to interrupt. Well, there, there's, still, to... there's still time. <laughs> Insert yeah, here right. the reference to death and taxes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Um, the the only two archons we can never t truly get rid of. Um, the uh, uh, but I, I think Jonathan, you made an interesting point there too about like what any of the um, the safe choices that uh, that a person might make instead of choosing artistic or spiritual practices and careers is. Uh, the last couple of years have shown us that that nothing is certain no. <laughs> um, and everything is change. Uh, um, what was I was going to mention something there too about, um, oh shoot, something that, that uh, uh, you were saying there, Kristen, about, um, oh dang it, uh, the teaching art. Uh, the two uh, oh, I'm pardon me. Uh, no, the two types of Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think also, but the question that Jonathan asked, could you do anything else? And I think there's there's that uh, there's the feeling too that like part of the reason I'm I'm here, the reason I'm in, like sitting on the on the show with uh, with Jonathan, and that we're part of the like the the group that we're part of and the AJC and all of this stuff is that is that uh, honestly finding finding um, some of these ideas uh, finally made certain things that I'd felt but never had words for make sense. Mm -hmm. um, which also kind of becomes one of those things that, yeah, I couldn't, I can't do anything else because once faced with that moment, um, it's hard to just go like, oh, okay, I'm just going to put that over there and go back to doing something that doesn't, that doesn't connect to that feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think about that a lot in, in regards to the, you know, the main spiritual community that Jason and I are part of, which is the Apostolic Joannite Church. And I'm not about to do a commercial for, for the community, the, though I love it deeply, right? Because, you know, sometimes people ask me, you know, why, why are you in this church? Or why don't you just be a mystic in a mainstream church? Or, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and because it is, uh, um, uh, uh, but the thing is, is I, I'm a Gnostic, and so I need to be in a Gnostic church. And I investigate. I'm not saying that we're the only Gnostic church or, or we're the best, but it, it's um, it, it is a welcoming place, and it's not full of uh, abusers and rapists. Uh, not that I, that that's not a, a slam at other Gnostic churches. I just mean some occult organizations. Yeah, no, that's that is a, a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a problem. So yeah, so it's it's not perfect, and it can some people view it as kooky, some people view it as stuffy because it's a high church tradition. Um, um, I know that it's not perfect. I know that I'm not perfect, but it's it's where I need to be, right? It's it's full of swell people, and it's a Gnostic church, and I need to be in a Gnostic church, not a not a um, uh, a Christian church where where I can where I can be a mystic. So yeah, there is there is just I I have to me personally just have to. This is uh, again almost like the the compulsion thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't know if any of that made any sense. And there's not a question there. <laughs> this is. This is turning into my psychoanalysis session. <laughs> it's supposed to be an interview, but um, okay. We we have been. Thank you so much for joining us, Jason. We were we we are getting to the fifty-two minute mark. Um, Kristen probably needs to have uh, a life, <laughs> um, but but we can start <laughs> going in. Yeah. Okay. Well, we don't we don't need <laughs> to end, but we could if we want to get into the home stretch. Right. Uh, uh, Jason, do you, do you have any questions? And if I already just ask anything, Jason, and then Kristen, if I already asked it, um, you can uh, give a complete opposite answer to uh, completely confuse the audience. So exactly. just say the exact opposite of what you said last. It's the time. new Aeon way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jason, you're muted. Yeah. The thing that. Um, uh, that really struck me actually when I saw the the just the the notion of sparks from dark woods uh, was that the a warm nest in, uh, to find a warm nest in your mind statement, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if again if you've already answered this or if you're going to give me an opposite answer, but I'd love to hear what that uh, what spurred that phrase because I love it. I think that it, it goes back to things I was talking about before, where I have these things that are very living to me but I want those ideas to be living in other people. Um, and a lot of them come through the form of uh, the little creatures that have made and stories that have written. And um, I think that that is the goal 
of uh, a lot of the art I make is to take that narrative that I have and what's living to me and see if it can become living for other people. Yeah. I well, you, you know, Krista, we, we did talk about some of those themes, but but it's an excellent question, Jason, and I think you did give uh, an answer that really does elaborate. So so thank you so much. And Jason, my other half, that phrase really grabbed me too, and I almost asked her. So it it, just, <laughs> it does go to show you that two Canadian Libras who were born on the same day had the same relationship with nature are both Gnostics uh, and have theater backgrounds may, may be intrigued by some of the same things. So. And I think the only reason I asked the question is you, and you didn't is because I was born two years earlier. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, I, I guess we better wrap up. Um, uh, Kristen, again, if you can, if you can give us your plugs, tell everybody where to get the work. Maybe we can start with Aonic comics.bigcartel.com. Yep, the book, which will hopefully be released um, by the end of next week, once whenever the copies arrive and I make sure they're good, you can find that at the Arianic page on Big Cartel. Um, you can find my work on um, Kristen Midart on Instagram. Um, there should also be, I just made a website, so there should be a link to that there as well. And then you can also find us on Aeonic Comics on Instagram as well. Fantastic. Okay, well, thanks so much, and uh, I'm sure we will be in touch, and we're looking forward to this book and, of course, all the uh, great publications uh, that, that you're putting out. Yeah, thank well. you for having me on. This is great. Ah, oh, it was awesome. Thanks so much.